Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. Before we begin, we want to inform you that this RTOERO webinar will be recorded and shared. RTOERO is a bilingual trusted voice on healthy active living in the retirement journey. And today's webinar topic is self-care throughout the retirement journey. My name is Muriel Howden. I am the Executive Assistant and Senior Outreach Advisor for RTO Yaro. I will be moderating today's session and providing active offer for any participants who wish to ask questions or have information related in French. Throughout the webinar, feel free to use the Q&A feature to submit your questions for the panelists. Bonjour et bienvenue à notre webinaire dont le sujet aujourd'hui est prendre soin de soi à la retraite. Je suis Muriel Howden, adjointe de direction et conseillère en liaison à RTO ERO. Je serai la modératrice de notre session d'aujourd'hui. Et je vous invite à poser vos questions ou à partager vos commentaires en français dans la boîte de conversation questions et réponses afin de les soumettre à nos panélistes. Before we begin the webinar today, we would like to pay our respect to the indigenous land that connects us across Canada. I am speaking to you today from the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Odenosoni, and the Wendat peoples, which is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We acknowledge, recognize, and honor the ancestral traditional territories on which we live and work, and the contributions of all Indigenous peoples to our communities and our nation. Je m'adresse à vous aujourd'hui du territoire traditionnel de nombreuses nations, incluant les peuples Mississauga de Crédit, Anishinaabeg, Chippewa, Haudenosaunee et Wendat, qui abritent aujourd'hui de nombreux membres des peuples des Premières Nations, Inuit et Métis. Nous reconnaissons et honorons les territoires traditionnels ancestraux sur lesquels nous vivons et travaillons, ainsi que la contribution de tous les peuples autochtones à nos communautés et à notre nation. Merci. Thank you, Nick Welch. So I would like to uh, remind you to submit your questions in English or French using the Q&A box. If your question is directed to one panelist in particular, please include that in your question. The chat will not be monitored, so please ensure that questions are entered through the Q&A feature. Je vous rappelle de soumettre vos questions en anglais ou en français dans la boîte à questions et réponses. Si votre question est destinée à l'un de nos panelists en particulier, Veuillez l'indiquer dans votre question. And now, I'd like to introduce RTOERO Board Chair, Rich Prophet, who will introduce today's speakers. Rich? Thank you, Muriel. Our presenters today are Alka Chopra and Shindwan Yugaratnam. Alka Chopra is a registered dietitian, a certified diabetes educator, and a self-care advocate. Alka's self-care system is an inclusive approach that takes into consideration the pillars of wellness, which are physical, social, emotional, spiritual, intellectual, environmental, as well as financial and occupational. And Shindwan Yokoratnam is a registered kinesiologist with the College of Kinesiologists of Ontario and a level two certified with exercises is Medicine Canada. Shinduan has developed a significant interest in working with physical activity programs for those dealing with chronic diseases and physical impairment. Elka and Shin, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Muriel. Thank you so much, Rich. Okay, I'll start by sharing my screen. I hope everyone can see it. All right. Okay, so the topic uh, that I have for you uh, today is self-care through the retirement journey. Uh, and oftentimes I find lots of uh, my own patients, you know, missing that piece. So that's why it's an important, significant topic. So that's what we'll be talking about. 
So in, um, in my professional opinion and my judgment, and of course, life experience as well, self-care is an investment and it's not really a waste of time. It is something that is very sustainable and it makes you more productive. Uh, like I can go on and on on this, but in the interest of time, just, uh, just know that it is important and it makes the use of the time that you have more sustainable. You can do much more if you invest yourself in self-care. So these are some skills that the World Health Organization has, uh, you know, has recommended. Uh, there are 10 of them, but I will, uh, but for the purposes of this presentation today, the main focus is on decision making, self-awareness, uh, interpersonal relationships, management of stress and management of emotion. And the reason why I picked these five is because as we embark into a ret retirement journey, uh, all of you on the call today, some of you might have just retired, some of you might be uh, might have been retired for a longer period of time. So everyone is in a different uh, state. But these five uh, skills are something that really, I think, bind all of us together. And now these are some of the roles as, as a person, uh, you know, when we are when we are active in our jobs. We all are, we work, we work as an employee, we are a leader for our children or in the role that we play in our jobs, a colleague, a friend, a spouse, a parent and a child, a sibling, or maybe a social contributor in networks. So we play different roles, but this is pre-retirement. Things begin to change when you are in your retirement, after you've retired in the early stages or in the later stages. So for some people, uh, we might want to choose a second career, uh, which is probably less stressful. And that, that's where I see myself. Uh, well, of course, I'm not retiring very soon, but I see myself getting into a second career. Uh, there are relatively less responsibilities. Probably the children have settled or, or you don't have that pressure um, like of you know, bring, bringing up little children, coming back to daycare and all those. Some of us might even have some financial freedom as well. It is not, uh, these things are not generic. Every situation and every person is different. And at the, on the other hand, there might be some limited financial resources as well because you're not working like full time, the 35 hours, 40 hours a week. On the other hand, there is some time flexibility as well because you're not, you're not stuck in a nine to five unless you are doing a second career, but a second career could be maybe you're working part-time. So there is more flexibility. Now, in during the retirement phase, um, this is again, my own personal opinion. Some of you might differ on that, is that there's a big emotional transition for many people. Uh, after being in, um, I'm gonna say in a role for a um, significant number of years, when someone enters into the retirement phase, it's an emotional change for them. And it takes a while for people to adjust to that. Some people are just ready for it, but for some people it is an emotional transition and takes a little bit of time to get settled because it is a, it is a really big change. Now, the ultimate role you need to perform at this life stage is really take care of yourself. Because my motto is that if you don't take care of yourself, no one will. So I live by that motto and I do, um, and that is why I'm a self-care. I, I like to call myself a self-care advocate, uh, talking to patients, talking to my family, my husband, my children, everybody, and even my parents. My parents are in their 80s. And, you know, this is something that we have been taught uh, from the from the get go, so really take care of yourself. Give yourself the priority, and give yourself the credit of all that you have achieved in your active years. And now you're in the retirement days. You deserve that. So you really, really need to take care of yourself. There's one message that I'd like you to take from today: is definitely give yourself that importance. Give yourself and have a good relationship with yourself. So the importance here, and I mentioned to, about it a little bit before, uh, but I <clears throat> mentioned it again here a little bit. So when we keep sacrificing, you know, our, our needs, again, I'm not saying that do not pay attention to the needs of the family, it's very important. However, if you are sacrificing continuously, that that's poor self-care and that often leads to fatigue, burnout, and there's lots of dissatisfaction, which actually leads to more, uh, I think more problems. 
On the other hand, when there is good self-care, you know, you take good care of yourself, mm -hmm. there is more satisfaction, there's more resilience. And it becomes, uh, life becomes much more, uh, more fun. And it is definitely, uh, you know, more worth it. So there is a saying that you can't save a drowning person if they don't know how to swim. So if you don't know how to swim, you know, there's no one who can really save you. So using self-care as an instrument, right? Use it as a tool so that you are able, you're keep your, you are able to keep yourself in tune with yourself so that you're able to help others. So it's actually a full circle in, in my mind, okay? Now, again, going back to the importance of self-care and in my bio, uh, I said, so my bio does, in, does include that, you know, I believe in the pillars of wellness. So these are the pillars of wellness. So there are seven of them, and that's emotional, financial, social, spiritual, occupational, physical, intellectual, and environmental. So if you take a look at these seven, uh, eight, sorry, eight of them, uh, pillars of wellness, this is really a holistic approach because health really is not just eating healthy. It's not about eating vegetables or eating lean meats or going for a walk. That's not what health is. Health is all these, all these pillars when they come back, come together and they become like, um, like homogenous, it's only then that you feel well, you feel good. So some critical challenges that, um, that again, these are based off my own experiences that a lot of people will say to me on, well, if, if asked them this question, that do you have a self-care system? And they look at me like, okay, Alka, what are you talking about? Really? Uh, but, uh, what are you talking about? I don't have the money to, you know, to spend on expensive vacations or I don't have the time to spend at the spa. Well, self-care is not about going to the spa. It is not about spending hundreds of dollars and going on a destination vacation. Well, you can't do that anyways right now. However, the challenges that most people have are their workaholics. They are stressed and they don't even recognize that. There is burnout. There is no boundaries. They do not know how to say no. And there's always excuses that I have no time. I have so many things to do, just can't do it. It's expensive, like I'd mentioned to before. People pleasing, you know, they're always out to make others happy, people, other people very happy. They're perfectionists. Now, perfection is a very subjective term. Perfection, something which is perfect for me might be completely imperfect for someone else. So it is a very subjective thing. However, they choose to believe that they are more perfectionists. Then there's life transformations. You know, life is not static. It is not a straight line. Things change. And then there is compassion fatigue. This is something I see so much that uh, lots of people will show compassion towards their neighbor or to someone else, but there is no compassion towards themselves. And compassion towards them, not having that compassion towards your own self and giving yourself that due importance that you have, it really burns you out and it really fatigues you out. So something to be really cautious about. So with all this, with all this being said, right, what are, how do you recognize, like what is going on? How do you know that uh, there are some, uh, that something is not right with you? So these are some uh, red flags and warning signs. Uh, which you probably could look out for, that if there's loss of pleasure or enjoyment in your personal life. So you're suddenly feeling that something is, something is not right. You're not enjoying the things that you used to enjoy when you were uh, you know, in your full work life. Things have changed. Uh, there's depression that is setting in and now clinical depression is completely different. So that is out of the scope of this presentation but you are feeling depressed, you are feeling sad, uh, you are not enjoying yourself, um, there's problems, concentration, you know, you cannot, con when you're working on something, uh, you are completely in some other kind of world, so there is problem with the concentration, and you're get, you get anxious very quickly, any little thing, and you begin to get anxious, so look out for these warning signs, there are some, you make too many mistakes, or errors, and there's loss of objectivity. So this is very important because sometimes when people are, uh, what, they, what they will try to think is that everything that is happening around them, anything that goes wrong is directed towards them. And that is because the relationship with themselves has been, uh, is distorted. 
And that really comes from that compassion fatigue, depression, and all those points that I had mentioned to you before. And lots of people will start isolating themselves. They do not want to go out for a coffee with their friends. They do not want to pick up the phone and maybe talk to their children or maybe do not want to sit with their spouse. So these, so they start to isolate themselves uh, from, from others. So these are some things to really think about. And then there is emotional reactivity. So there is there's an outburst for anything that anyone says to them. People will, will there's a, always a, rea well, yes, there is the Newton's law for every action, there's a reaction, but this reaction is different where you are reacting in a very negative manner to anything that is being, said to you. So these are some uh, some more here. Relationship issues. So when you are, you know, this compassion fatigue, you're, uh, and even when you're isolating, there is emotional activity, all this leads to relationship issues. And you can't sleep properly or there's disturbed sleep and fatigue. So you're tired, you wake up in the morning and you are tired. So, and or you're tired for the entire day. So these are some signs to really, really look out for uh, if you and and if you find any of them, it's I think it's a good time to maybe talk to somebody. Maybe you want to talk to your doctor. There, there's help out there. There's support out there. But all this can be avoided if you really think about self care. And we'll get into that now. How do you how do you get aware of that? How do you know something is missing? Right. So these are the stages of awareness. Where number one is you're unaware. Someone is completely unaware. Uh, what's going on, no, no clue what's there. And then the second stage is pain aware. All this comes from being aware and being alert on what is really going on around you, what is going on with you. And once you're on level two, where you are aware of something is not right, then level three is where you begin to find for solutions, right? You begin to find ways as to what can I do? Something is not right. Do I need to seek some support? Do I need to seek a new hobby? Do I need to go for a walk? Do I need to leave the house? Maybe I'm homebound. COVID has, um, has really taught us many, many things. Although it's not the best situation, however, it has taught us many things. So being solution aware, what can you do to overcome that situation? And then there's product aware, like what is available out there? There's so many online sessions. The fact that you're here today to, uh, to really attend this, um, this event today is all about self-care is one of the products I'll say, where you are being aware of what is going on and being physically present. And then finally, the last stage is most aware. And when someone is most aware, those people will actively look out for some solutions as to how can we get into a, how can I get myself into a self-care system. Self-care is something that you've got to really uh, get into actively. It's not a passive thing. It's not a one and done thing. It's okay. You say, okay, I did some, something last month. No, you've got to in invest and indulge in self-care every single day. So how can your self-care system really look like? So it is you recognize, so you recognize. So here we, we went through these stages of awareness. So you are at stage five, right? Where you're most aware. And when you're most aware, you've recognized it. So you want to try something new. Maybe like I said, you want to uh, try a new hobby. Maybe you like to dance. Maybe you like to do some painting. Maybe you like to learn music, anything like that. So you want to try it, explore and practice. Just doing something once does not cut it. You've got to try it. You've got to practice it a couple of times to get the real and experience the real benefit. And it's only then that you will understand the real benefits. And then you've got to constantly remind yourself every single day. Okay, like I remind, I, I'm an avid crafter and I paint, I do lots of crafting activities. So I remind myself every single day in the morning that Alka, today, there is something that this is what you've got to do at least during whatever time of the day, whether in the afternoon, whether later at night, whatever, but it's a constant reminder to myself that I need to take care of myself. And then share. So sharing really helps because when you share your wins, when you share your happiness, when you share your own, um, uh, what's going on in you with anybody who you trust, who you think you can share, whether it is your partner, whether it is your husband, whether it is your children, whether it is your close friend or 
any or maybe previous colleague, when you share the experience becomes even richer because what happens is it starts to form a community. And when you start to form a community, the self-care system becomes very alive. Okay, I went really fast. So now something to recognize is that there is no limit on what you can do or take care, right? So you can, you can continue, continue to do lots of things, just recognize that. Try, this is again, this is really um, this whole thing. I just went a little quicker in the interest of time, but this is here, you're recognizing, then you're trying lots of things, and then you're exploring and practicing, get regular exercise, do fun activities, and remind yourself. Now, this is also very important that when you are reminding yourself, you are you cannot fix everything in the world. You cannot. So uh, recognize that as well. And you do have the support. And sharing is all about community that I just mentioned to you. So living mindfully, and I'm pretty sure everyone has, you've heard the buzzword these days, mindful living. So when you live mindfully, it actually leads to happiness. So good stuff happens as time goes on. Good stuff happens, bad stuff happens. This is life. It's not a straight line. There are ups and downs. And we all live, learn to live with that. Okay. So this is just a short video that I have for you here. And I'm going to play it. Perfect. You may have heard this word mindfulness. It's become something of a buzz phrase of late. So I'm going to give you one simple serviceable definition, which is this. Mindfulness is the ability to know what's happening in your head at any given moment without getting carried away by it. Imagine how useful this could be. Just as an example, you're driving down the road and somebody cuts you off in traffic. How do you normally react? I think most of us, we normally react by having a thought, which is, I'm pissed. And then what happens next? You immediately, habitually, reflexively inhabit that thought. You actually become pissed. There's no buffer between the stimulus and your reaction. With just a little bit of mindfulness, in that same situation, you might notice my chest is buzzing, my ears are turning red, I'm having a starburst of self-righteous thoughts, I'm getting angry. But you don't necessarily have to act on it and chase that person down the road screaming at them with your kids in the back of the car thinking you've gone nuts. Now. You might be thinking, don't I need to get angry sometimes? Aren't I justified? I would say yes, but probably not as much as you think. The proposition here is not that you should be rendered by mindfulness into some lifeless, non-judgmental blob. The proposition is that you should learn how to respond wisely to things that happen to you rather than just reacting blindly. And that, my friends, is a superpower. How do you get it? The way to get it is through meditation. I believe that meditation and mindfulness are the next big public health revolution. In the 1940s, if you told somebody you were going running, they would have said, who's chasing you? But then what happened next? The scientists swooped in, they showed that physical exercise is really good for you, and now all of us do it, and if we don't, we feel guilty about it. And that's where I think we're headed with mindfulness and meditation. It's gonna join the pantheon of no-brainers like brushing your teeth, eating well and taking the meds your doctor prescribed for you. Let me just close by saying, mindfulness is not gonna solve all of your problems. It's not gonna render your life a nonstop parade of unicorns and rainbows. Nonetheless, this is a superpower and one that is accessible by you immediately. So this is, that was just very quick and about uh, mindfulness and just a really quick, uh, some ideas over here, sleep, exercise, eating well, relaxation, connection, and, uh, you know, really expecting to go through stages of emotion, which is normal. Emotions is part of being human and structuring your days, uh, setting small goals, growing your friendships and having community. And maybe consider an encore job, something small, having a new budget, do volunteering. These are just some ideas that just came through my head. And give yourself the flexibility to really figure it out. 
So this is in closing here. So you can pour out of an empty cup. You want to take care of yourself first. Yeah, thank you very much. And now it is Shin's turn. Thanks, Alka. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, this topic, uh, as I was creating uh, the uh, slide decks, uh, I felt was more appropriate given where we are with the pandemic. Uh, whether we're retired or not, uh, we have been relegated to using our workspaces at home uh, or whatever home office may be. So I uh, felt that I think it was appropriate to talk about um, office ergonomics, but you know, creating that healthy work uh, home space uh, uh, for us to, uh, to enjoy and you know, uh, be safe in. Okay, next slide. So ergonomics, um, really, if you were to break that term down, it's uh, ergo means work, and nomics is the meaning of natural rules or laws. So when you put the two together, ergonomics is really the science of work and the person's natural relationship to that work. Uh, it's, a, it's a very, uh, it's a huge hot topic discussion right now in many workplaces. Um, even my current job, I deal with a lot of ergonomic requests all the time. Um, but it's all, it's very important to understand how that work impacts uh, the requests and the needs for uh, for such uh, uh, demands. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so there's two fact uh, categories of factors that we do need to consider uh, when we're setting up our workspace um, and how that influences our bodies. Uh, when it reacts to the kind of work we do. And in particular, when we're at home, when we're using our, uh, our personal computers um, for a prolonged period of time, you know, what we need to consider. So the two that I've highlighted here are the environmental conditions uh, that we're exposed to. So this is our physical surroundings, uh, hearing, vision, general comfort. So the kind of, uh, when, I kind of when I speak to general comfort, I'm sort of referring to hard seats. Uh, cramped spaces, temperatures, and you know each of our homes are you know made differently. So uh, that sort of encompasses uh, the environmental conditions that we're uh, exposed to, uh, as well as the physical stressors. So the kind of the type of activity that we're doing and how that affects our body. Okay. Uh, so uh, in speaking more about physical stressors, uh, these can place uh, additional stress or specific body parts. Um, and how we routinely perform our work will be directly affected by the stresses uh, placed on these body parts. So if we're looking at uh, improper lifting, you know, that can uh, evidently cause substantial strain in your low back, uh, which can then result in pulled muscles or a slip disc, uh, depending on how severe, you know, the improper lift is. Uh, and repetitive movements can then also uh, cause chronic damage to nerves, tendons, and joints. Uh, and these uh, repetitive injuries are called cumulative trauma disorders, or CTDs. Uh, we probably also have heard uh, through our, our uh, you know, your teaching careers or where else you've uh, you know, worked at, repetitive strain injuries, uh, RSIs or musculoskeletal disorders. Okay. Um, <clears throat> next slide. So cumulative, tra cumulative tra uh, trauma disorders. Um, so I've kind of broken it down to, again, three components so that we, again, uh, we understand where, where the term comes from. So cumulative really uh, references um, something occurring gradually over a period of weeks, months, years, okay? Trauma is the bodily injury to our nerves, tendons, uh, nerves, tissues, tendons, and joints. And then the disorder is the conditions that are causing physical ailments or abnorm abnormal conditions. Okay, so that's sort of a, a Webster's Dictionary uh, breakdown for you guys. Next slide. And so when we're talking about CTDs, RSIs, MSDs, you know, any of those terms are interchangeable. Uh, some examples could include carpal tunnel syndrome. So this is uh, very common uh, for those who do a lot of administrative work, um, you know, for the duration of their careers um, or, you know, have been exposed to it, uh, you know, doing stuff at home. Uh, epicondyl epicondylitis, ah, tongue twister there, uh, also commonly referred to as tennis elbow, uh, uh, tenosynovitis, uh, the trigger finger, or bursitis. Uh, these are some common um, uh, conditions that we may be exposed to uh, that can be classified as uh, an RSI. Uh, some of the risk factors that uh, you know attribute to that, um, 
our repetition. So I've mentioned uh, uh, the interchangeable term uh, repetitive strain injuries. So that pretty much encompasses that when you're doing something on a repetitive nature uh, for a prolonged period of time, chances are you may be putting your body or your joints at risk of uh, injuring itself uh, in time. Uh, to complement repetition, uh, when you're um, you know, always exposed to awkward positions or postures, uh, that's also something to note of, and also excessive pressure or force that you exert when you're com when you're completing a, a task. Further, uh, so you know, if we're looking at awkward positions, um, so I kind of put a little uh, diagram here of what you most commonly see with those. You know, you know, if, you, if there's children at home or or ourselves included, and sometimes I'm also guilty of this. Uh, where you know you find yourself leaning forward uh, in a flex position in front of your chair, um, you know, in an awkward uh, position where you're you know typing with your wrists at odd angles, uh, you know you have raised shoulders while you're typing. All of these uh, factor into uh, you know a lot of workplace injuries or discomfort that people uh, experience at home. Uh, you know, for again, just to further extend on the awkward positions discussion, uh, you know, reaching to use the mouse. So say, you know, I currently have my mouse right here at, uh, in like at, at a millimeter's reach, but some people may have it further out, you know, based on, you know, the way their desk is set up uh, and which, you know, force, force that individual to keep reaching. Uh, so that also attributes to the, the concept of awkward positioning, uh, twisting your neck, to, to look at a monitor or to look at your phone. Um, and imagine doing that on a repeated basis. The amount of strain you put on your upper back and neck uh, is also a, an identifiable risk factor. Um, I mentioned excessive force. So <clears throat> when we're talking about excessive force, uh, I've highlighted the few that we should be aware of. Um, so typing with too much force or, uh, you know, in slang we refer as pounding the keys. So, you know, uh, you know, I see my siblings do this a lot where they're just, you know, going at it. Um, you know, it's hard to interpret whether or not they're typing fast or if it's just the way they utilize the keyboards. Stamping. So, you know, we may have uh, form work or uh, administrative work that we do that requires stamps. So imagine, you know, uh, in a flex position with your wrists and you're always, you know, repeated, uh, that repeated delivery of this motion um, can attribute to that. Lifting heavy boxes or carrying office equipment. Uh, so heavy boxes is applicable really in any setting. Uh, we do groceries, we may carry them in boxes. Uh, you know, we're moving. Um, you know, that's excessive force that, you know, that would be atypical on most occasions, uh, uh, in, you know, relative to what we do on a daily basis. And uh, I find this is also very important, uh, using improper grip. So if we do not have a good grip on what it is that we're transferring, chances are you're going to be straining a lot of stuff uh, with the body. But, you know, uh, as much as all that information was, uh, you know, eyebrow raising, uh, the good news is there are simple ways to really help yourself. Okay, and that's what we're gonna use uh, the rest of the presentation to talk about, and which are prevention strategies. So one of the things I focus on uh, with most workplace uh, parties uh, is really looking at uh, simple ways of sort of taking care of your body and, and your back in particular, uh, if you can uh, help so. Uh, so one of the things that I stressed is uh, avoid leaning forward at your desk. So our spine is a natural, uh, it's a natural S curve. So we want to maintain that as much as we can. Um, so you want to look at supporting your lower back uh, where you can, uh, you know, if you have, um, you know, any uh, support devices that help with, you know, giving that comfort for your low back, you may want to utilize that in the chair, whichever chair you have. Um, and further, keeping your feet supported on the floor or using a footrest if you need it to be elevated. The, the whole notion is you want to be ideally sitting in a very comfortable, leaned back, relaxed position as if you know, you're sitting in, in a living room chair talking to a friend or a family member. So it's got to be extremely relaxed. Uh, further to this, uh, your elbows, so again, just looking at the whole uh, chair positioning, uh, should be at a comfortable angle where while hanging at the sides from your shoulders. Shoulders should remain relaxed in a lowered position while typing. So, you know, I'm not typing right now, 
um, speaking to you guys directly. But if you notice how I'm looking at, at you all, uh, it's very relaxed. Like I'm not feeling any strain at all uh, uh, with my upper back uh, or my shoulders or my wrists or my elbows. So extremely comfortable. Um, when we're talking about typing, you wanna avoid typing with your wrists at odd angles. So you wanna maintain a neutral position um, not bent up or down or side to side. So the image that I uh, include on the slide actually sort of illustrates what we're kind of looking at. It should be, um, you know, if you're driving a car, you know, you want to be as relaxed as possible because you don't want, you know, you know jerky movements to affect your, uh, your cognition or, you know, your experience. And it's the same thing when it comes to typing. You want to feel as if you're just coasting and, uh, this uh, image with, uh, especially with the way uh, the, um, the hand is controlling the mouse is exactly ideally how you'd want to handle uh, uh, your uh, computer accessories. Neutral wrist position. So when we're looking at the keyboard, so this is where a lot of uh, the carpet tunnel syndrome uh, and issues come into play. Uh, the keyboard should be located at an elbow height and rest flat on the desk. So, um, uh, you want to have your, <clears throat> you know, your feet on the, the feet of the keyboard should always be retracted. So some people like to have a, you know, different angles going, but you know, I like, I you typically encourage that it's flat. So it's easier to sort of maintain that constant. A positive angle towards the user should be avoided. Um, although negative tilt away from the user can be uh, you know, allowed. Uh, I typically tend to, uh, again, encourage people to keep their keyboards flat where you can. Uh, you know, this keyboard, for instance, has this, you know, uh, stands, kickstands that you can sort of kick out. But if I do this, it allows me to keep a more neutral position with my keyboard. So something to factor in. But again, each to your own, as long as you keep uh, in mind of how your wrist positioning is. Um, and, you know, the, <clears throat> the arm should float over the keyboard as if you're playing a piano. So you know, again, very, very relaxed, very uh, still. And, you know, even with my positioning right now, I, I can easily, my, re my elbows are resting on the, uh, the armrest of my chin. I'm easily just uh, floating away on my keyboard if I need to type something. So it should be extremely relaxed. Um, and if you, again, if the angle of, of your keyboard needs to be altered appropriately, uh, by all means do so, as long as it's not causing further strain. Uh, so again, I kind of mentioned this a little bit uh, on the previous slide. Uh, you know, keyboard should be adjusted, you know, lower than normal desk height. Um, if the keyboard is not low enough, try raising a chair height. You want to prevent your legs from dangling by using a footrest, ideally. Um, keep your home row of keys at elbow level. So anything that you commonly tend to access uh, in terms of your uh, key functions on your keyboard, you know, try to keep that at accessible height. Um, and the biggest thing is adjusting your chair. Uh, so you want to be able to adjust your chair uh, to the comforts of your height, uh, and would you feel safe where you know you're not causing uh, further back or cervical strain? So this uh, just at a uh, at a high level. Uh, there's a lot of uh, stuff that I kind of sort of threw in here uh, on the slide, uh, but this is sort of what you could consider to be a neutral computer posture. So this is again applicable in any desk. Uh, whether it's at work or at home. Uh, but key thing is you want to have your monitor in front of you. Again, we don't, you know, nowadays we all have LCD, LED monitors, but uh, you want to keep your you know, monitor in front of you and then about arms looked away. So you should be able to see, you know, all the characters on your screen nicely. Uh, if you're you know, typing something, if you have a document holder that's close to the monitor, it's even more effective. Um, you know, you want to keep your mouse, uh, you know, next to your keyboard. Both at a height that's equivalent to your seated elbow height. Um, you know, I mentioned um, on the slide about adjusting your seat height. You know, you can you know factor that in. You know, your backrest also should be provided uh, should provide firm support. And um, you know, the seating the the seat pan should also be able to support your full thighs, uh, and it should not and should not contact the back of your knees. So uh, all of that is you know factors into uh, an ideal com neutral computer posture. Uh, the same slide uh, that was in French. Um, uh, I, I think this is common sense, but in terms of uh, you know the keyboard use, you know to avoid really the carpet tunnel 
triggers. So uh, you know, try to use a light touch when you're um, typing. Uh, when you're doing any sort of typing at all, try to, using two hands to perform double key functions like Control C or Alt Alt F, instead of using one hand to sort of maneuver that would be ideal. Um, so just getting familiar, utilizing you know bilaterally where you can, it would be very helpful. And position frequently used items so you don't have to always keep reaching. Uh, so you know if you you know I usually have my coffee mug on my left hand side of my uh, of my desk set up here. I just know that I don't have to keep reaching out to the back uh, on the side or in front where I'm not you know causing further strain. So just uh, you know just keeping items that you'd want to uh, reach very instantly where you're not thinking about it and it's not going to cause further strain uh, actually can go a long way. Um, this diagram right here sort of illustrates uh, sort of the breakout from your, of your usual work area, what you do occasionally and what you do that's non-working area. So this is kind of the ideal uh, measurement setup you want to sort of factor in and in terms of, you know, the, 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 uh, the length to which you would be reaching it. Uh, so it, it's not a hard science uh, per se as to you know, where these numbers come from. This is more or less... Uh, uh, commonly uh, sort of recommended measures, uh, you know, for your ideal uh, setup uh, where you can. Next slide. Uh, again, placing your monitor in front of you, not at an angle if you can. Uh, the next point I cannot stress enough, uh, taking breaks to stretch and relax is absolutely imp uh, important. Um, anytime you have 20 minutes uh, after a task, say if you're reading the, an article in front of you or you know, chatting with somebody online, just take a break you know, for about you know, a minute, two minutes where you can. So it just gives your eyes a little bit of a break and gives your back a bit of a break too. So uh, do factor that in um, as you're you know, you know, uh, getting involved more with your computers. Uh, holding your mouth lightly and, uh, you know, further to that, you know, keeping your hands and arms warm, um, you know, uh, warm muscles, joints tend to function a lot better, uh, less uh, in uh, occurrences for injuries. Next slide. Uh, and then this is, an, this is more of a self-recognition uh, task, and that is paying attention to signals from your body. So if you sense that now I mentioned work here, but if your neck tends to hurt while you're, you know, uh, staring at your monitor for, you know, 15 minutes, you may want to look at, you know, how your body's positioned to sort of uh, identify what the root cause could be for the soreness. Uh, so a question that you could ask yourself potentially is, are you holding your neck at an awkward angle while you type or talk on the phone? Now, uh, we tend to say if we're writing something, we have our cell phone, you know, right here and we're sort of doing this. Chances are you're going to be straining uh, not only your your right side of your neck, but you, you could also be hyperextending your left, right? So just keeping an eye on that, and you know what are some you know ways to mitigate those uh, uh, those poor pra practices. If you're looking at vision, um, <clears throat> you know you want to employ a 2020 rule, uh, which is basically to you know refocus your eyes for 20 seconds every 20 minutes. So Again, I mentioned earlier, if you're looking at and you know watching or, or reviewing something for 15, 20 minutes, you want to sort of take your eyes off the monitor and do something else uh, to really, uh, really readjust and uh, get your eyes refocused. Uh, keeping your monitor screen very clean, this is highly important. Um, the amount of HEI complaints or uh, uh, <clears throat> HEI complaints that I hear about is uh, quite profound. Uh, so you want to be able to keep your work area clean where you can. And having regular vision care is also helpful to reduce your eye strain. Some other vision related uh, symptoms that you should be identifying with your doctors uh, includes tingling, pain, uh, loss of strength, numbness. These are things you want to keep an eye out for uh, when you, uh, if you do experience them, please do uh, seek uh, a physician's care immediately. Excellent. You know, headaches, uh, you know, many headaches are caused by some of the stuff that I mentioned earlier, like dry eyes, uh, but further to that, you know, monitor glaring or uh, strained eye muscles or tired muscles, which could be attributed to just, again, just uh, a prolonged uh, focus or uh, lack of sleep, right? So you want to factor that in. The next slide. And these are things that uh, I've highlighted here in terms of what you can do to, uh, you know, help avoid eye strain where you can. Um, 
And the, if you focus on the last point where it said looking up in a way every few minutes or so is, is actually not just good for your eyes, but it's also good for your neck in terms of really getting that uh, uh, fluid motion for your, uh, for your cervical uh, spine. It's absolutely imperative. Uh, next slide, I've mentioned here some ergonomic products that you may wanna consider. Um, you know, you can be done in consultation with an ergonomist, uh, ergonomist uh, or it can be done really by good self judgment, uh, just, you know, there's a lot of ergonomic supported uh, keyboards, wrist pads, uh, wrist rests, mouse pads, chairs, adjustable desks, uh, screens that uh, can be consumer uh, purchased. Uh, fit to stand workstations may be applicable depending on who, uh, you know, the audience is. Uh, so, you know, you may want that for your own desk, but, you know, cost can be uh, factored in, but uh, this, that's also an option to look at if you especially want to be ben, uh, benefiting from, uh, you know, straining your back. Then the next slide is just an image of what an assist to stand desk is. It basically gives you the option to sit with a chair or you can take a break, stand and still use it. And you're still getting the full benefits of your workstation. And that brings me to the end of um, my portion of the presentation. Wow. Alka and Shin, um, thank you. Thank you for sharing your knowledge, uh, your research, excellent tips and information. Uh, what great presentations you both um, provided us with. So a big thank you. So I see that we've received some great questions and we'll go to as many questions as possible in the time that we have today. Um, before we do so, I would like to remind you to submit your questions in the, um, uh, in the Q and A box. Uh, your question, if your question is directed to one panelist in particular, so to Alka or to Shin, please include that in your question. Um, remember, the chat will not be monitored, so please ensure that questions are entered through the Q&A feature. Uh, je vous rappelle de soumettre vos questions en anglais ou en français dans la boîte à questions et réponses. Si votre question est destinée à l'un de nos panélistes en particulier, donc à Alka ou à Shin, veuillez l'indiquer dans votre question. Um, okay, so let's look at our question. I'm going to start with the first one um, uh, with Alka. Um, so Alka, here's the question. COVID has impacted all our lives and routines. Do you have any tips for adjusting self-care practices in the pandemic world? Yeah, <clears throat> that's a great question. So COVID has impacted everyone. It's, uh, it's, um, it's not a very good situation, but it has impacted every single person. So <clears throat> what I would say is uh, the first thing is that you start with what you like to do. You've got to do things at home. There are lots of online sessions, depending upon your interest, if you like to do exercise if, or if you would like to you know, take up some art classes some craft classes, dancing classes. Um, there, there are there <clears throat> in the last one year, I've seen lots of classes which are really geared towards the older adult population. So just a little bit of research uh, definitely will be required. And, uh, and yeah, for, I would say start with what you enjoy. So like what I said in my presentation, what is it that, and shortlist three, four things, and then start with one, don't overwhelm yourself. And then just get into it, uh, depending upon something that you probably wanted to do when you were in your full-time job, you know, that is it's a good time to really uh, do it at this time. That, that's great. Thank you, Alka. We had a question from Danielle, and I think it came from your presentation, um, Alka, and uh, she was asking if you could elaborate on resilience. <clears throat> yeah, resilience, I equate resilience to tolerance. You know, when we are all homebound, we have too much of each other. Sometimes it's nice to go and sit in a separate room away from everybody, because when you are with your own self, you learn to really be more tolerant and more calm and more patient. So really uh, just be very, uh, and again, when you start to take care of yourself, you will find that you're, you will build that resilience in yourself. If you continuously ignore yourself, ignore your needs, I stressed a lot about the burnout signals in my presentation being more mindful that present that, that last video that was there, I would say, if you, because I'm assuming you'll get a replay for this, look at that, that video again, and you can actually find it on YouTube as well. And if you, I can even send the direct link to maybe Muriel or Stephanie, anybody, 
people want to watch that video. So resilience in this time and age, and COVID is, we know COVID is not going away very quickly. It's gonna be here for a long time. So definitely build in that resilience and uh, really be patient. Patient number one with your own self, your own emotions, because our outbursts are all a result of our emotions. Start with self-care, start small. Wonderful, thank you, Alka. Actually, the next one is for you. And Shin, the following question is definitely for you. Um, Alka, um, if you have never followed a self-care routine, how can you start? Yeah, so I kind of answered that question many, many times, but I will say, start small. Self-care can also be going to the dollar store, getting yourself an adult coloring book, or maybe Sudoku, for example, and sit alone in a separate room. Maybe it's, maybe it's your patio. It's really good. We are enjoying the weather right now. Enjoy it while it lasts. Maybe go sit outside. Whatever area you have, where you can be by yourself, it is important that you spend time with your own self. Extremely, extremely important. So if you start, start, start really small, don't, and again, you don't have to spend lots of dollars um, on getting into a routine and do it every single day. Whether you allot 10 minutes, 15 minutes, but do it every single day. You need to make self-care a culture you need to make it a lifestyle and only then that you will be able to, to see the impact on yourself. And then you will also, uh, you know, build resilience as well that we were just talking about. Great advice and probably good for all of us. Thank you. Um, so the next question is for Shin. It came in French. So Shin, I'm going to read it in French first and then in English. Um, the question is, Je me surprends souvent à me pencher en avant lorsque j'utilise mon ordinateur portable sur mon bureau. Avez-vous des conseils pour m'aider à perdre cette habitude? So um, I often catch myself hunched, leaning forward over my desk when I'm uh, on my laptop. Any tips to help break this habit? Shin? Yeah, so I would recommend, um, I think the easiest tip that I really uh, suggest to folks is to get out of the chair um, because, you know, we're very habit driven. We are so goals oriented for the most part that we want to just get the task done and then move on with the next thing. But the, 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 the price that we pay for that is more, is, is more profound. So just getting out of the chair actually just automatically breaks our routine, gets that stretching in, um, and incorporated right, like right, right there. Um, also being a little bit more mindful about uh, back support. So I mentioned on the slides about, you know, if you have say a pillow or anything that supports your lower back to give you that uh, support will actually augment your posture a little bit better. Um, those are two things that I would recommend. Um, you know, we, we're now in a smart, uh, smart device world, right? So, uh, you know, I spoke about the vision care and covering the 2020, uh, 2020 rules. So that same rule can, also apply for you know how long we sit. So if you were to you know take your smartphones, I'm assuming all of us have smartphones, um, using the timer uh, time function on our phones and set a timer for anywhere between 15 to 20 minutes. Let that run out. That the alarm signal will then basically trigger us and say, oh, that's it. Let's get up. Let's move on. Those are like small, uh, easy to adapt uh, uh, habits that we can take on to sort of break that cycle of you know. Uh, poor posture. Yeah, that, that's great. Those small, but make a big difference, right? Very good. 100%. Thank you so much. So the next question is for Alka. And after that, um, after this question, I will actually call um, the chair of the board, Rich Prophet, and our CEO, Jim Grieve, uh, since we have a question for all the panelists. So it'll be a good question, and we're looking forward to that. So for now, um, Alka, here's the question. How can I get back into a healthy routine after COVID? My partner and I have different approaches. So I have to say this is a great question because I think you touched on that, Alka, earlier. Everybody has reacted differently to COVID, right? And some people have done pretty well and some people not. So how, how do you work with that? You know what? If you and your partner have different approaches, it's completely okay. Don't yeah. overthink it. Don't uh, like I had said to you that you can. You are not. You're not 
the one person who will solve the world's problems. You can't do it. So if it is different approaches, really that is again, the resilience piece comes in, the tolerance piece comes in, it is completely okay. Although what I will say is that it would be nice that if even with the two different approaches, learn to enjoy each other's system, right? right? So even if it is for five minutes, it doesn't matter. Time is not the issue here. It is learning to acknowledge each other's interests and acknowledging and taking interest in what your partner is enjoying and being a part of it. My husband, I'll give you my own example. My husband likes to do karaoke. He just sits in the living room okay. and has the music on and he'll just sing. Do I sing? Of course not. I don't sing. But I will just sit with him for five minutes, six minutes, and then I'll quietly go to the other room to do my own stuff. Now, does that mean that I'm, I am singing with him? I'm not. But it's just that five, six, seven, ten minutes where even I have learned to enjoy him singing. Uh, he's not the best singer, but he enjoys it. And, and I enjoy him seeing, he's enjoying himself. It makes me laugh too. Sometimes I'll do a video recording and I'll send it to everybody in our family group. And then we'll laugh together. So it's just understanding each other's little, these are small things. There's no money involved in it. Just enjoying each other's company. Yeah. This is so great. Actually, by doing that, you're not only connecting with your husband, but with your whole family. Exactly. This yeah. is amazing. So <laughs> what's up? Uh, like what Shin had mentioned, you know, we all have those electronic devices. Use it to your interest. WhatsApp can be used the way you make your life, you define your life the way you want to do it. So really, you know, try to find those little, little things which will make it better. That, that's right. And actually, this is what we're going to talk about right now. So I'm actually going to call the chair of the board, Rich Prophet. Um, and our CEO, Jim Greaves. It's going to be really nice to have the four of you uh, respond to this question. So maybe we can start with Rich. And here's the question. Can you share your favorite self-care practice or routine? Rich? Thank you, Muriel. Uh, one thing that I've always attempted to do is I listen very strongly to Elka's uh, strong rec recommendation that repetition is a key. So consequently, on the hours that I'm not working with the RTO ERO, <laughs> for six months of, uh, of the year, I golf five days a week, which is key. And the other six months of the year, I play hockey five days a week. And uh, in between times then, I'm teaching myself how to play the piano. And, uh, and of course, at the top of the list, of course, is being with my family. That's Fantastic. I don't know if we can, um, you know, uh, equal that. But uh, Jim, uh, shall no, we I hear can't. from you? I definitely can't top that, Rich. It's just awesome that you do that. I love it. <clears throat> well, my favorite really is playing my drums. They are about two and a half meters away from my desk. I'm working home, obviously, with RTO. And uh, as Shin said, that 2020 is the perfect rule. So when my, <clears throat> when my um, Zoom call is over, I stand up, I go over. They're electronic drums, so no one else but me can hear them, although I love to share them. But I can play with some of the biggest bands in the world and nobody knows it but me. And uh, it's just great. It's great practice because I'm still in the band. So that plus walking and swimming, you got me. That's amazing. So Shin and Alka, you see what you're against um, uh, at this minute, right? Uh, Shin, do you want to give us your favorite um, self-care routine? Yeah, this is actually something I do religiously. So, um, you know, I foam roll at night. So just before I go to bed, uh, just the, with the nature of my work, you know, I'm always on my feet. Uh, you know, now with COVID, we tend to be sitting a lot. Um, I always find my upper back, hip, uh, neck area very stiff. And so I don't want that to affect my sleep and my sleep quality. So I take three to five minutes just before I get into bed foam roll just really focusing on deep stretching um you know you can buy these foam rollers uh, at winners um you know they sell it in like various fitness uh stores and i can you know recommend a few uh, after this presentation um you know through links but i do it all the time and honest to god like the the effect that i feel the next morning where i feel fresh you know just you know well rested you know no stiffness whatsoever it just leads to a more productive day 
Uh, and that's something I just uh, bought into and I do it. And uh, I got my, you know, my family, my wife, they, uh, they have also sort of bought into that concept too. And they've, they've seen a difference too. And it does go a long way. That's amazing. Such a great yeah. tip. Um, Alka, let's hear from you. <clears throat> so for me, um, like I had mentioned in my, I am a crafter. I love to get my hands dirty with paint, with plaster, uh, like anything that I can get my hands in, I'll do that. So every single day, even if it is, if it could just mean going and touching my art supplies if I have no time, but I will go to the room, I will touch or maybe do a bit of organization if I don't have the time to paint or craft anything. I work with clay uh, and I work with pastels. So that is what I do religiously every single day, even for it, let it be for 15 minutes. And the second thing that I do religiously is I do meditation, like every single day. Again, when, I, when I'm getting into bed and I always do it in bed or in the morning, the first thing in the morning or the last thing at night. So yeah, that has really kept me afloat. Um, I got into meditation a few years ago when I was having a very stressful job and that is what really helped me um, come back to who I am. I I, I find it amazing how between Rich and Jim and Alka and Shin, you all covered in the self-care self routines, the, 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 the body, the mind, the spirit, and the activities. Um, it's just fantastic. Lots of great ideas for many people. Thank you for yeah. that. Just keep in mind that I will, I will emphasize it a lot that you need to bring in self-care as your lifestyle. The way you breathe, the way you eat food, you know, go to the washroom, brush your teeth. It has to be a part of you. If it's not a part of you, it's not a culture, it will not happen. So it's okay. really a change of your mindset too. Thank you, Alka. Um, Shin, I think I'm going to send this next question to you. It's from Lisa. And the question is, what if you work with two monitor screens? What's the best setup? Good question. I, uh, so I swear by two monitors myself, so yeah. I, I uh, totally advocate for it. Uh, it. You know, it comes down to the, the desk. So certain desks uh, allow for the installation of, a, of a, a clamp mount. So you can, so basically it's like, you know, think of a clamp that you use at an auto, uh, auto shop that, you know, used to grip something. Uh, so the same concept, there's, there's mounts where there's dual arms that support the monitors that you can clamp on the desk, um, sort of up, off the, to the side, uh, that you know, gives you that support. Um, what I have at home, I don't have uh, a gap to install a uh, clamp mount, so I have a, sort of a flat, a flat bed dual monitor. Uh, so this... Uh, is sturdy. It's a it's a very heavy base uh, that I you know that supports two monitors, um, and it, it works well. And I can adjust based on my needs. Uh, I would recommend that you know anytime you can get a mount, it just gives a bit more flexibility in terms of your vision, uh, a little bit more support. Uh, I find that I can you know see better. I'm not straining myself. The ones that come in with the uh, with the the from the factory, meaning uh, that comes with the monitors, uh, I would avoid doing that. And further, it creates more space on your desk. Uh, if you can, uh, you know, play something else that's more valuable to you, like uh, your laptop or books or whatever, uh, by all means, get them out. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, I think, so I'm gonna send the next question. I think uh, it's uh, Jerry's question actually um, to Alka. And after that, I will call back again um, our, the chair of the board, Rich Prophet, and, and our CEO, Jim Grieve, for the next question, since it's related to RTO. But um, Alga, here's Jerry's uh, question. Could you comment on the role of social media and the news media in negatively impacting our well-being? Mm -hmm. That's a great relevant. Um, so social media <clears throat> is now a part of us. <clears throat> whether you um, hate it, whether you love it, it's there. So the, the wise thing is to really have boundaries. Now, in my presentation, I had mentioned boundaries. Now, you need to have boundaries with people. You need to have boundaries with social media. It is so important, and even with news as well. 
So here's the way I do it. So yes, I am on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. Um, I yeah, YouTube is not social media, but mainly, and I'm not on Twitter. Twitter is not my cup of tea. However, if you are on social media, you probably want to start thinking of assigning times to it, right? So do not be on your phone 24, not 24, for the entire time you're awake. Mm -hmm. And do not get to your phone or your social media accounts the first thing in the morning. That is the, uh, that is the worst thing that people do. So you want to refrain from that. So if I would suggest something is, of course, you need to know what's happening in the world. You need to know the news. And social media is a great way of getting what's current. Sometimes things get quicker on the social media than, any, than anything else, right? So you really need to be aware, be aware, but to have your frame, your boundaries. So what I do is I'll go on my social media accounts Maybe after in the morning when I wake up, I do my meditation, I get out of bed about five, 10 minutes in the morning, then five, 10 minutes in the middle of the day, and then later on and in the evening. So that's the kind of routine that I follow. And, and also keep in mind that you are not there to save the world. You cannot do it single-handedly. If somebody has written a negative comment on Facebook and Facebook is actually notorious for that. I use the term notorious because it's not the greatest word, but it, people literally bite each other. So do remove yourself from those groups or from the discussion. You do not need to react to everything, right? Yeah. So know your, you, you, you do not have to do it. So think about your own, keep yourself first and really uh, try to look at things which make you feel and give, um, uh, if, if even if you are commenting, if somebody has posted, you're in some Facebook group, for example, somebody has posted, a, you know, a nice message or maybe a nice project someone has been working on, you know, give a, appreciate that person's work. And when you start to appreciate what the other person has does, it's like you feel good internally yourself that, you know what, this is something nice I saw and I really commented and the person will say thank you to you. So it's a really good feeling. So you really decide your own boundaries, what you want to do with social media. Social media is there for a purpose. Use it wisely and not yeah. against you and define your boundaries, define your own self. If that's in your hand. Yeah, no, absolutely. What you yeah. want to do with social media is entirely your call. Facebook is not coming to you and saying, oh, you know what, this is what Alka, you've got to do this. Absolutely not. So you, def you make your own definitions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alka. So we have a few minutes in this webinar. Time is actually passing by very fast. So um, I'm glad to be welcoming again uh, Rich Prophet, um, the chair of the board, and Jim Grieve, our CEO. So here's Diane's question, um, uh, Rich and Jim. It would be great to survey RTO Euro members to see what healthy benefit priorities they have. Self-care can be expensive and coverage through benefits would facilitate better outcomes. Has there been any discussions about this new approach? Well, actually, Muriel, uh, at the president's meeting next week, we're going to be discussing certain aspects of the membership survey that we've had during the past year. And we've had an overwhelming response from them, uh, from the from our 82,000 members, uh, we've heard uh, oh, about 14,000, I believe. But uh, what we're doing, we have a variety of topics. That's an interesting one to do. We've done volunteering with respect to that, uh, not only in the membership survey, but part of that, my goodness, I, I think of our publications, Renaissance. Here's one issue, uh, what you're doing, you know, it's at the active lifestyle. And in there, it talks about setting goals. Uh, for your life. And that's just one copy. And there throughout the, uh, each copy, and there's challenges that are going forward with respect to uh, wellness and life. And one of the mandates of one of our committees is to recommend strategies and resources for wellness. So uh, thank you for that suggestion. And uh, we certainly will follow through uh, strongly because this is a, a very important and timely topic, wellness. Well, Fantastic. 
it's, yeah. a, it's a super question, one that one would expect from RTO ERO members because they're so engaged. <clears throat> what I would say is that every one of our 51 districts has a district health representative and their prime role is to make sure that they are funneling really good self-help, healthy living ideas uh, to the membership at large in their district. So for example, uh, we give them praises of, of work that's in the McMaster Optimal Aging Portal, uh, which is a very trusted source of really good information. And the same with Lumina Health, Lumina, which is a Sun Life product, and we're part of Sun Life, um, is available to our members with lots of great ideas for uh, how they can live that kind of um, personal self-help life that uh, Alka and uh, Shin have been, have been talking about. Um, I, th I think the issue of asking our members what they do is something that we should uh, deeply consider uh, either in our health, when we do our health survey or when we do our next full-on membership survey as well. Good suggestions. Amazing. Um, Muriel, if I could yep. just add one thing I forgot to mention is that that is presently just uh, very recently on our website and it's coming to you in the very new future if you haven't had it, our a list of 50 activities that our members can do in retirement. And it's quite amazing and quite uh, fulfilling if you can accomplish some of those 50 activities and look forward to them on our website. I don't wanna say what they are, you look and you shall find. Rich, this is brilliant. Thank you. I'm sure Sheen and Alka, uh, you know, approve. This is this is fantastic. We'll look to this. And with that, I will actually let Jim do the wrap up for today. And thank you so much. Muriel, as always, a great job. Thank you. Listen, the theme of, of this series is thought leadership. And that's where we want RTO to be, right at the forward edge of thought leadership. And what better topic than self-care, especially we hope towards the end of the pandemic, um, people desperately are looking for these ideas. Great suggestions, Shin, for the kind of the ergonomic and uh, the appropriate way to lay out your home office or your home connection with grandchildren, et cetera, that's almost always virtual these days, unfortunately. <clears throat> and then Alka, the, this mindfulness just keeps coming up over and over. We preach about it in schools, we talk about it, in the organization, this organization, and the value of meditation um, is so important for people on a daily basis. And doing it for you and making it part of, as you call it, your culture is the mm -hmm. only way it's going to work. If it's just a fad, forget about it, right? Um, so honestly, thank you so much, Shin and Alka, for um, really great thoughts that have been put out in, into the 340 people plus that. Uh, came uh, to this webinar. You can watch, uh, speak now to those of you who are listening, uh, you, can, you can watch for the recording of this webinar uh, because we're going to send it to you <clears throat> probably within two or three weeks so that you can revisit some of the uh, elements. You can certainly revisit the, um, the beautiful little video that um, Elka showed you. Um, share the link. You can absolutely, when you get it, share the link with your friends and relatives and tell them how great the issue of self-care really is and, and some great advice that's given to you. Um, I want to invite all of you who are still here and still listening that uh, we have another webinar coming up. It is on September the 29th at 1 p.m. And listen to this, reviewing your finances throughout retirement. This is one of the hottest buttons in retirement. A, can I afford to retire? And B, now that I'm retired, what do I do to make sure that I still can afford to retire? So uh, we have uh, Toronto Star columnist David Ashton, um, and David Ashton is coming to talk about current market investments, uh, new options for investments, uh, advice, and maybe some portfolio tips for each of each of us who tune in. So that's Wednesday, September 29th, again at 1 p.m. Registration's open. You can sign in now. And for all of us, and from all of us to Elka and Shin and the whole team that put this all together. A sincere thank you and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Take care of yourselves. Yes, you do.